This is California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're with us today. Our guest now is Ted Lou. He's a member of the California State Senate. Later on in the program, we'll be speaking with Alan Lowenthal, also a member of the California State Senate running for the United States Congress. But Mr. Lou, we thank you for joining us. Thank you. I want to speak with you about a couple propositions that will be on the November ballot. And let's start with Proposition 30. That is the Governor's Tax Initiative. It would increase sales tax by a quarter cent for four years, increase taxes on the wealthy for seven years. Are you in favor or in opposition to Prop 30? I'm absolutely in favor of it. And it's not just the governor's proposition. It's supported by a wide range of stakeholders, uh, such as the California Federation of Teachers, the Courage Campaign, public safety groups, and education groups up and down the state. What's interesting, though, is there's one organization that's not supporting it, and that's right. the PTA. Right. They are supporting a proposition that's known as Prop 30. 38. 38, thank you for the correction, which is uh, being supported by Molly Munger, a very wealthy woman. That initiative would increase income taxes on everyone on a sliding scale, 0.4% right. to 2.2%, money dedicated to education. Sounds fair, sounds right. as if it would go to the right place. What's right. your concerns? Well, the PTA is not opposing Prop 30. They're just neutral on it. Um, in terms of Prop 38, I, I happen to believe Prop 30 is a better proposition um, because it does fund not just education, but also the public safety realignment, which is very important. But in addition, uh, Prop 30 simply has the best chance of passage. It's polling well above 50%. Uh, the problem with Prop 38 is if you raise income taxes on the poor, so the poor and the middle class, it makes it hard for the voters of California to support that. At the same time, right now Californians are being hit with a series of new taxes. We have the Amazon tax that just went into effect that puts sales tax on internet sales from larger companies and those with affiliates. The lumber tax is kicking in, the fire tax is kicking in. Um, you know, it could be that we're feeling a little uh, tax hangover. Well, so uh, nobody uh, likes taxes, but Prop 30 to me is simply uh, the best solution given these difficult times. Uh, just you know, with the, with the Amazon tax, uh, if you went to a brick and mortar store like a Barnes and Noble, you pay the sales tax. So this was actually just making it fair for the brick and mortar stores. Um, but in terms of Prop 30, uh, we absolutely need to do that to fund our schools. Otherwise, trigger cuts will happen in November and about $5 billion will be cut from our schools. We also know that LA County, which you represent a portion of, has its own sales tax increase on the ballot in November. It's an extension of a sales tax increase for transportation projects. Some would argue somewhat inopportune, right. given that you are now asking the voters of Los Angeles County, the largest county uh, in the state, to increase sales tax twice on one ballot. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different competing tax measures. Uh, I am uh, fully in support of Prop 30. To me, that's simply the most important because I do believe education uh, is the key to our future. And we just have to do this. Otherwise, we're going to be doing drastic cuts to the schools that my kids go to and, and other school children. Now, I don't believe you're up for re-election right now, but I presume yeah. that you're home from the end of the session. You're talking to your constituents generally. Yes. What's the mood about Prop 30? I think people are generally positive. And again, uh, every poll out there has a polling at well above 50%. And I think that people understand, uh, not only do we need to increase the revenues, but also putting uh, the fair share payment for people who are very wealthy. I think people view that as a fair thing to do. But polls can be tricky. And we all thought that a cigarette tax would pass in June, which was polling at 60%. Right. And, you know, we're not in Kentucky, we're not in right. North Carolina, we're in California, right. and yet a cigarette tax right. failed right. by a squeaker, but well, it failed. So the good thing about Proposition 30 is some of the largest uh, opposition groups have gone neutral on it. So the mm. California Chamber of Commerce is neutral on this measure because they do understand the importance of education. Many groups that would normally fund opposition to uh, this proposition have gone neutral because they view it as very, very important for the state. I know recently the governor signed a reform package dealing with pensions. How important was that in terms of messaging on Prop 30? I thought it was very important, but I don't think it was just a messaging reason. Um, clearly, pension reform had to happen uh, in order to curb the abuses in some of the areas that we were seeing. So we eliminated spiking. We did it go far enough? Uh, I believe it did. We eliminated uh, the airtime credits. Uh, we extended retirement ages. We put a cap on pensions. We put a 50-50 cost share with employees. So it had a comprehensive uh, set of uh, provisions in there. Um, there is... Uh, clearly always different things you can do, um, but I think at least at 
this time that was a good package. What about the health care side? Because those costs are spiraling as well for state workers and retirees. So that's, you were reading my mind. So mm -hmm. I think that's the next issue that will at some point need to be addressed. That Let's is talk about Prop 32. That's another initiative on the ballot. It's a little complicated, but purportedly what it intends to do is to eliminate contributions by corporations and by unions. I know very uh, a lot of print publications have come out and said it doesn't do what it says it does. Correct. I'm just a neutral observer, but what do you make of Prop 32? It's one of the most cynical and misleading propositions I've ever read. Uh, in fact, Dan Moraine with the Sacramento Bee, a columnist, he said it's a proposition that's dripping with cynicism. Because when you read it, it looks like it's this good government proposition, but in actuality, it's opposed by many good government groups, such as California Common Cause, the League of Women Voters. And the reason is because it has all these exemptions uh, for super PACs, uh, for Wall Street investment funds, for hedge funds, for some of the very folks that spend lots of money in these political races, and they exempt themselves from this proposition. So what it will do, in Please. effect, is silence unions and then allow super PACs and, uh, and Wall Street corporations and any corporation that's an LLC to spend unlimited amounts of money. So it's very, very unfair. What's interesting is we look at the same polls, and right now Prop 32 is leading. Correct. There is a good number of undecideds, but that being said, do you think that the voters will understand the argument you are making, presuming that it is accurate? I do, because um, just with the various newspaper uh, editorials and columns, the last uh, poll that came out showed that this proposition dropped by nearly 10 points. It went from 60 some percent to now a little bit over 50. So people now are understanding that Prop 32 is a very misleading proposition. It's not what it says. So what can we do though to try to minimize the influence, if that's the ultimate goal, right. of large entities? Be it corporations, be it unions, right. be it wealthy individuals. Right. Well, so the Supreme Court with the Citizens United decision really, I think, um, made a bad decision. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, the people who are supporting Prop 32 and who put it on the ballot are the same folks that actually uh, supported the Citizens United decision. So one way to do it is to reelect President Obama. Hopefully some Supreme Court openings come up and we get a different Supreme Court. That's one way to do it. I, I understand that uh, one of your colleagues, Mike Gatto, in the Assembly has been looking towards putting California on the record in favor of an amendment to the Constitution which would overturn Citizens United. You're I a lawyer. I support that. Uh, hard to do a constitutional amendment. I, I was going to say, I mean, that becomes very challenging. You need, what is it, three quarters of the states and four Correct. fifths or wh whatever it may be. I should know I'm a lawyer too, but be that as it may. So that's why a Prop 32 is so dangerous because it would effectively silence one group of folks and allow these super PACs to keep on doing what they're doing. But could one argue there's an equal protection flaw in Prop 32? Yes, I believe it's unconstitutional as well, but let's first try not to get it passed in the first place. But uh, it's called the Special Exemptions Act because of all the exemptions to the very folks that are advertising right now that have exempted themselves from this proposition. In our final moments, I want to ask you, I think it's Prop 34. Let me just make sure. I think that's the death penalty. Yeah, it's the repeal of the death right. penalty. Uh, not getting as much play as I would have expected. Um, what do you make of Prop 34, which would... Uh, all but, it essentially repeals the death penalty in California. Um, so I know I'm an elected official and you expect me to have read all the propositions. Uh -huh. I have not read Prop 34. Okay. Um, so I will read it and I will let you know the next show. Which is fair, but more generally, what do you make of, let me ask you this. I mean, well, are, so I think there are clearly are problems with the way we implement the death penalty in California. Uh, I believe if you sort of do a statistical look at it, there's right. probably uh, disparate impact on certain classes of defendants. Um, I also believe, I happen to believe that it is constitutional. So it right. is simply a policy choice for the voters of California, whether they want to do this or not. Fair enough. His name is Ted Liu. He's a member of the California State Senate. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Alan Lowenthal, also a member of the California State Senate. My name is Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on California Edition. In what year was the initiative, referendum, and recall process added to the California Constitution? 1893, 1911, 1914, or 1921? The initiative, referendum, and recall process was added to the California Constitution in 1911. 
Welcome back to California Edition. My name is Brad Palmer. I'm glad you're with us still. Our guest is Alan Lowenthal. He's a member of the California State Senate. He's running for the United States Congress. That election will be held on November 6th. Thank you, sir, for joining us. I want to get a sense from you as you are out and about with voters in the district, which is LA County, Orange County split. What are they saying to you? What are the, what's on the top of their minds? Well, obviously it's jobs. They're concerned about jobs. They're uh, also health care. I just yesterday ran into someone who not only had lost his job, he's in his 50s, he's very, very worried about uh, not being rehired, but he's even more concerned, and that's why he really wants the Affordable Care Act to go forward, because he is so frightened right. that his family will not have health care. And I want to talk about the Affordable Care Act. As you know, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act. They did give states the ability to opt out of some provisions specifically dealing with Medicare. California's opting in. Uh, yes. Under the Schwarzenegger administration, they announced they were opting in. So as you talk to voters, are they getting a sense of what the Affordable Care Act will do? Because there was a lot of confusion about it prior to the Supreme Court's decision. Yeah, and, and it's really obvious that the attitudes about it are shifting. At first, that really their only understanding, Brad, of the Affordable Care Act was that they were frightened of it. They were told that it's going to, uh, it's, uh, it's going to increase their premiums, it's not going to work. Uh, and the more they learn about it, the more they like it. I'm not saying everybody does it, but more and more people are waiting and want to see what, what occurs with it. A lot of concern also has been spoken by businesses, yes. especially small businesses, yes. because they're not clear as to what their burden will be, if I yes. can call it a burden. As I understand it, it's only firms over 50 that will be required to offer health insurance or pay a tax penalty. Now, that's still a, a burden. And, you know, a, a business over 50, I mean, some would argue that's on the smaller side. So what do you say to these businesses that are kind of in this middle range? Well, you know, businesses really want to offer health care. Let's be honest. Businesses do not want their workers not to have health care. And so I think that we, you know, the question really is the affordability of it and uh, uh, how it's going to work. And I think the real question will be how the health exchanges work right. in California. And California has been one of the states that has really been aggressive in developing their health exchange. And as I understand it, what an exchange is, it will allow these small businesses, individuals to pool together. And as a result, that pool will have bargaining power. So they'll be able to get Absolutely. the rates that you know, the Disney is... Uh, That's right. Uh, That's right. Remember, what we're trying to do uh, is to, to see whether you can use, create a national health plan based upon a market-based approach, and that is to maintain uh, insurance companies and to provide, if everybody's into it, if everybody's in, uh, then, and we have health exchanges that the, the small person, I mean by the small, your individual right. small business or the, can purchase not as an individual, but the same kind of purchasing power, as you pointed out, that a Disney has. Oh. That will bring down the prices and provide them more options. And that is really going to be the trick. Will the exchanges cross state lines or are they state by state? Do you know? Uh, they're, they're state by state at this moment. But, but that's another issue that has been raised. And we will see that as it goes forward in the future. Uh, that is, will it be, be more beneficial to create either regional or multi-state kinds of exchanges? But I think right now we're, we need to get those exchanges working, and California is in the lead in doing that. As a result of the selection of Congressman Paul Ryan to the Republican ticket, the issue of Medicare has been injected back into the debate. Yes. And as we know, Mr. Ryan and now Mr. Romney uh, they are supporting a plan that would create a voucher yes. for senior citizens. Yes. And that voucher would allow them to acquire health care, health insurance. As I understand it, the voucher would not increase in value based upon increase in medical costs, but increase in inflation. Right. Uh, it, it would be, there's a cap. You would, you would be given, it's going to cap at a certain amount. I believe it's a little over, it's $6,000. I'm not quite sure what the exact amount is but that anything above that will be out of pocket. And so what's your sense of this proposal? Some would argue it offers more choice. Others would argue the cap is problematic. I think the cap is problematic. I think we already have choice built into it. You know, already now you have Medicare, you have Medicare Advantage. People have the choices right now of 
of going to uh, uh, as being part of the Medicare system of, of applying for uh, uh, health maintenance organizations right. and, and they can do that. They can, they can either choose their uh, fee for service which is pay, paid by Medicare or they can be in a Medicare uh, managed care program. I think that the problem though is that um, and I've seen this on the insurance committee in the state senate. I've mm -hmm. sat on the insurance committee and I've seen that there are some unscrupulous, although the vast majority of agents are scrupulous, really care, but there are unscrupulous people that prey upon seniors. Mm -hmm. They buy, have seniors buy uh, health insurance or life insurance that they don't need, reverse mortgages. And well, that was part of the mortgage crisis. That's right. And so the state has taken real uh, a real close look and trying to regulate that and make sure that and the problem with this if we move the health insurance now entire health insurance for seniors to vouchers and people get into their 80s and now they're told or they they think that they have to choose between programs rather than having all their medical care provided for as part of that you're going to find that there will be people that will not get the kind of health insurance that they need. What and about, we've seen that with other forms of insurance. What about the Romney-Ryan plan that would create a block grant to states for Medicaid? That's a disaster. Why do you see that it that way? That is a total disaster. We are talking about those that are the, the most vulnerable in society, the blind, the disabled, people who have, who the, the poorest members of society, people who need health insurance or who need medical services and and actually qualify for it today instead of receiving those kinds of services that money will come back to states in a block grant and those states will decide whether to do it or not and so we may lose the ability to and have people who really are the most vulnerable in our society. And what's interesting is as a result of the Supreme Court decision, states can opt in or out That's right. starting 2014 of the expanded Medicare plan. Right. And what we know is some states, including California, are opting in. Yes. Other states, Florida and Texas, are opting out. That's right. And there seems to be a red state, blue state divide. Um, does that cause you concern? I mean, you are a Californian, so presumably, if the plan goes as intended, we will see this expanded coverage. But look, you're an American as well. And so what happens with our fellow citizens in Florida, in Texas, who pays for their care? Well, you know, right now, everyone is paying for the non-insured. And so we will still have that, if that happens, the same, same opportunity. You know, really, what, what we, if we just step back for a while, you know, we're just beginning this experiment mm -hmm. or this, this, you know, with uh, this national health plan. When we first instituted Social Security, uh, the Democratic Party instituted it. The Republicans said it's the demise of the nation. It's going to end the nation. We cannot be providing this payout for people in their retirement. Then when we developed Medicare, Republicans said it's the end of the nation. You can't do this. This will bankrupt the nation. Now, we, they really have, you know, they un, everyone understands it's part of who we are as a people. But the same thing is going to happen with the Affordable Care Act. There are those states and those places that are going to opt out, but they're going to ultimately find that it's, as the Congressional Budget Office says, in the long run, it will be less expensive to do it this way. Costs will come down. We will use less, ca less less ability to have to rely on emergency room services. People will get preventive health care and our health care costs and we'll begin to deal with the issue of capping prices and doing that. If So I don't think as many are going to drop out as, as they say. In the first couple of years, 100% coverage by the federal government, down right. to 90% by 2020. I mean, one could argue that that's a nice chunk of change. That's right. Okay, his name is Alan Lowenthal. He is a member of the California State Senate running for the U.S. Congress. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on California Edition. When the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010, how many Democrats voted against it? 24, 32, 34, or 38? 34 Democrats voted against the Affordable Care Act. All California Democrats voted in favor of the act. Welcome to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest today, Tom Geeslin, he is the general manager of the Oceano Community Services District, which is what? 
the Oceana Community <laughs> Service District is this beautiful place on the Central Coast where my district office and my staff and my team provide water, sewer, lighting, garbage collection, and parks to the good people of Oceano. You're being humble. Oceano is absolutely majestic and magnificent. It's unincorporated San Luis Obispo County. It's actually right next to San Luis Obispo City, am I right? And no, right. It's, it's, it's part of the five cities area, oh, right. and it's yes. right next to uh, Grover Beach and Arroyo Grande, um, and we're, we're the ones that have the wonderful sand dunes that everybody right. comes down from all over and rides their dirt, dirt buggies it, and off-road off vehicles. And you also have a state park. Yes, we have a state park as well. Now, which the dunes is part of right. the state park. Now, in the news, we've heard a lot about municipal bankruptcies, uh, Stockton, San Bernardino, Mammoth Lakes. And I have learned that when there is a bankruptcy of a governmental agency, it usually is not an actual city. It can be a special district. Now, I understand the Oceano Community Service District was, let's say, at risk. I don't want to say it was going to go bankrupt. I don't know. But there were challenges before you arrived. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that that's, that's really fair. And, I, and um, it was at risk. There was, uh, it was grossly mismanaged. And we, we came in being me. And then I uh, indoctrinated the staff. And we put a plan together, executed that plan. And I'm very happy to say that that risk is, uh, doesn't but, exist yeah, anymore. But let's be more specific because I think it's four-fifths of all municipal bankruptcies, I'll call them municipal in the broadest sense, are these special districts, fire districts, school districts, you know, community services districts. What had gone on, you know, publicly, what had gone on that was putting this district at risk? Um, the previous management had a complete lack of... Uh, cash and financial controls. Mm. And so that put everything uh, offset. They didn't, they hadn't closed their books in three years. Wow. Um, they had, as a special district, you're required to file audits uh, every year. So to the, with the county, which is your next level of government agency, they hadn't done that. We've got uh, two of the three years completed. We've got the third one uh, is in process right now. How does that happen? You know, I wish I knew. Um, I kind of choose not to really look at the past because uh, when I took the assignment, I took it as a consultant and I made a promise to the people of Oceano that I would do my best to rectify it, and, 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 and let, we have. And let's back up because I have to think a man who had worked in community, excuse me, commercial financing for years never expected to be running a community services district that deals with waters and sewers and lighting and parks. And yeah, rooms. that's that's pretty funny because mm. I get calls from my uh, uh, friends in the industry and clients and right. and they go what happened? They, they go they're paying you how much right. to do this and why are you doing it but I gave my word and uh, I actually am quite proud of it and it's an interesting story you had been the campaign manager for Paul Teixeira that's correct who is now a member of the Board of Supervisors that's correct. in San Luis Obispo County and it was through your work on Paul's campaign that you came to learn of the challenges facing Oceano. That's correct. People approached us during the campaign, citizens of Oceano, and said, hey, we got some major problems. Do you live in Oceano? No, I live in Napomo. See, there you have it. Yeah. yeah. And Napomo has a similar district, correct? Yes, they do. Um, so you've been on the job either as a consultant or a full-time employee for about well, a year and a quarter. Right. How has it been going? Have you been able to, you know, turn the ship? Um, we've turned, we've, uh, I have a, a board president that says I've righted the ship, <laughs> and so that's that's good. Um, the first thing I did, I'm a private sector guy, and right. this is my first time ever working in the public sector. Now, I've been up for commissions before and, and that type of thing, but uh, the biggest adjustment for me was the amount of uh, bureaucratic red tape that you have to go through that you don't have to go through in the private and, sector. And it's interesting because even though Oceano is not a city, it's unincorporated, the district has five elected members. Right. So it's almost as if you're the city manager um, dealing with the elected city council members. That's exactly what it's like. Um, and, and I actually uh, meet uh, quite regularly with the city managers of Grover Beach and AG because we are what I call them sister agencies on okay. a couple things. We. We work together on the Five Cities Fire Authority. We're all three of us are financially right. responsible, even though it's a separate entity. I understand. We work on the South County uh, Sanitation District. We, uh, though it's a separate entity, we are responsible for them for uh, 
their fiscal, um, uh, right. um, the financial, right. the financial input into their uh, into their operations. So, what lessons have you learned? Because you know, as I mentioned, municipal bankruptcies are very real now in California, municipal in the broadest sense. Um, what have you learned? What advice would you offer uh, a citizen, someone working with the city, uh, based upon your experience in Oceano? I would. Um, I like. Let, I'd let the people. I'd one. I want the people of Oceana know that that we're doing everything we possibly can to turn it into the model utility that should have been all all along, and we are close to being there. Um, I took care of the front of the house, which is the billing, the accounting, the customer service, and we've completely redone that. And there's money in the bank. We're paying our bills on time. We're honoring all our contracts. Now I'm focusing on the back of the house where you've got an infrastructure that needs attention and I'm working to bring money in into that arena as well so we can do that so that we'll maintain the quality of service and actually improve the quality of service to Oceano. And what if I, if I was in the private sector, we would be moving a little bit more quicker because... There's certain you, safeguards you need. You, but now I have to, you know, you have to go out for multiple bids, you have to mm -hmm. get everything approved by the board in excess of... Uh, in my case, it's seven thousand five hundred. Do you um, think that's a good thing? Oh, I think it's a great thing. Oh, good. But you need that check and balance. Right. And I have a great relationship with my board, and my board gives me uh, a pretty good leeway to go get things done sure. because my body of work has spoken for right. what we're trying to do. Interestingly, Oceano, unlike most, if not all, communities or virtually all communities in California, has a surplus of water. Yes, it does. Most communities are suffering from a water drought, metaphorically speaking. As a result of that, there's actually an initiative on the ballot in Oceano that's pretty unique. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, what happened was before I got there, there was a move by the board, which the, those board members are, I think there's only one person mm -hmm. that's uh, retained from that board. Mm -hmm. um, there was a move by the, the board to sell water permanently, and the people that uh, got involved with Oceano early on had the magnificent foresight mm -hmm. to contract with state water and contract with local. Lopez water through the county. I see. Plus we have our own groundwater that we pump, but we have about a 45 percent surplus of water and we're allowed to sell that water. And, and municipalities sell and trade water all the time, but this was an attempt to sell 100 acre feet forever. And the community of Oceano said, wait a minute, we just didn't invest all this time and money to have it go away, so this ballot initiative allows that if there's any transaction like that where you're going to sell permanent water, it needs to be approved by the vote, vote of the people. And the vote of the people is criti critical because they're the ones that have been carrying the load paying for this extra water. So it's not preventing the sale of water, it's no. just preventing permanent contracts. Permanent contracts. So has it energized Oceano voters? I mean, it seems like a sleepy issue, but clearly, you know, water's worth fighting for, as we've heard, you know, in the state of California. At this point, it, it, it it's kind of a sleepy issue because the board, when the board changed, that board immediately put in a provision and said, we will not sell water permanently. And so this initiative, uh, the, the, people, the people that drew the initiative are satisfied with that, but this is just an extra protection. I mean, the board could change at any The board time. could change at any time. So in our final moments, how are you doing? Be careful what you wish for. Should you have taken this job or should you have gone to work with Mr. Teixeira like your wife did? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to work with Mr. Teasing, Teixeira. And, and I want to be very specific about that. Mr. Teixeira has his own issues and my work no, works for him. I'm teasing. I yeah. take care of my own deal. Of course. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. There are some uh, testy times. No doubt. Um, and uh, some of the, uh, uh, <laughs> our, our, how can I put it? People that don't agree with some of the things that we do take it to a level that I'm a little welcome bit Welcome to the public arena. Yeah, welcome to the public uh, arena. His name is Tom Geisland. He is the general manager of the Oceano Community Services District. My name is Brad Pomerantz. Thanks for watching California.